Welcome to an introduction to Passive House. This is part five of a five-part series. In this episode, we'll review the Passive House methodology and take a look at a few more building examples from around the world. All right, it's time to dive into the methodology. As we've noted, we need to re-engage the passive building elements, the architecture, the structure itself, and empower it to do the heavy lifting. Reclaim the power of the architecture. The Passive House Institute provides an integrated methodology that organizes the work and keeps you on the path. The methodology focuses initially on the enclosure, then ventilation, and lastly on active heating and cooling. We'll look at the role of insulation and in thermal bridge free connections. A thermal bridge is where there is a break in the insulation and heat can more easily escape like a cold metal window frame in winter. We'll look at air tightness, high performance windows and doors with solar protection and high efficiency heat recovery ventilation. There is more to it, of course, but these are the key ingredients or principles. And these key areas and more are all entered into the Passive House Planning Package or PHPP energy model. The PHPP is an Excel-based tool which allows the designer to simulate the behavior of the building both during peak times, winter and summer, and over an entire year. This flexible, easy to use model allows for quick iterations and design alternate evaluations. The PHPP and all other simulations should be implemented not just as compliance tools, compliance in demonstrating that the building meets the standard, but as active design tools. Use the PHPP as a tool to allow the team to iterate and evaluate a host of ideas and options. You should evaluate real world assumptions and possible future scenarios for the building. This doesn't mean that the PHPP controls the design, but rather that it helps to inform the design with the performance data throughout the process. This is the essence of data-driven design, of good design. So with that, let's take a closer look at the ingredients being entered into the PHPP, starting with the first, right-sized continuous insulation. Generally, this means more insulation than normal, but not always. The idea is that you want to insulate to a level where you don't just shiver less, but you're actually comfortable. Typical buildings are often like an underdressed teenager wearing nothing but a hoodie in midwinter. They'll survive, but do we really want to live like that? You know that if you wear the right layers, you wear a good parka and a hat and so on, that you can not just get by in the cold, but actually be warm and comfortable. Our passive house is the same way. Or maybe think of it as a temperature rated sleeping bag, all surrounding the conditioned space. Principle two then extends this thinking to make sure that we don't have breaks in the insulation. In typical construction, these breaks in insulation, these thermal bridges, may not seem important in isolation, but they can be completely undermining to the building's performance. If we think of a thermal bridge as a cut, your project can easily die from a thousand thermal bridge cuts if you're not very careful. If thermal bridges are not controlled, meaning minimized or eliminated, and then calculated in the PHPP energy model, the resulting uncertainty will mean that you can't really optimize the HVAC system. It will be a bad building. Examples of thermal bridges abound. The thermal image on the lower right shows the common balcony connection turning the building into a radiator to the world, a thousand cuts. The colder interior surfaces can cause condensation as we see on the window frame at the upper right and mold on the left. To overcome them, typically we overheat we're treating the symptom with brute force. With Passive House, we avoid the problem in the first place. So thermal bridges typically occur at junctures where the floor meets the wall or wall meets the roof or at window frames meeting walls or balcony connections, structural connections. The, the energy loss causes thermal discomfort and condensation and moisture damages. Traditional energy models don't account for thermal bridges and is a big contributor to the oversizing of mechanical systems. As they say, you know, we're going to do it just to be safe. 
Again, in Passive House, we look carefully at all these connections and junctures. We work through the construction details and eliminate the thermal bridges entirely, or we minimize them and calculate them. We include them in our PHPP energy models. This results in increased predictability, produces lower risk, and holistically optimizes the construction. Now, principle three is an airtight enclosure, and we get it. When the subject comes up, many people might reflexively touch their necks and worry about air tightness driving poor indoor air quality and perhaps come to even nightmarish imaginings of not being able to open windows, that there's some passive house police out there that, to prevent you from doing it. Well, we need to set the record straight from the start. Two concepts are at play here. The indoor air quality, uh, super important, health all of that, and the basic concept of what we're free or not free to do in these buildings. Um, and so we need to flip, again, the common and wrong-headed thinking uh, regarding both. So first, let's address the issue of quality, indoor air quality. And the fundamental idea at work here is that it is very difficult to control the quality of something if you don't first have control of the thing itself. So if you can imagine the Enclosure is leaky and polluted outdoor air is moving willy-nilly through the building. In this case, the only way to have any sense of control is to overcome it with power. Never sure if that space or the other space is properly ventilated. And so like thermal bridges, we treat the symptoms with more power, more brute force. But in an airtight environment, the air is actually under control. And we can then very efficiently and confidently maintain its quality. Air tightness sets the table for healthy indoor environments. But on the second point, you say that may be well and good regarding quality, but can I open the windows? And the reality is that you can. Of course, there are no passive house police. You can open the windows, but let's think about it. Let's think about when and why you open windows. And we often open windows when the indoor environment feels unhealthy, when we're uncomfortable. And it's not that we want to open the windows. It's that we need the fresh air. We need to open the windows. It's not a want. It's a need. But in a passive house, you have clean fresh air, whether the window is open or closed. You don't need to open the window. You open a window because you choose to. It's a lovely day. Open the windows and let the breeze blow through. How lovely, how nice. Passive house counterintuitively is actually giving you the freedom to choose. So with that set straight, let's take a moment to talk a bit more about why air tightness is so important. And it is so important because it profoundly affects so many fundamental aspects of building performance. We've just spoken about it supporting indoor air quality. What about comfort? Well, it eliminates those annoying drafts, drafts we need to overcome within large mechanical systems, more brute force treating symptoms. Air tightness also protects the enclosure from moisture damages. It is not generally understood, well understood, or appreciated that air moving through the enclosure leaks can carry massive amounts of moisture with it producing another source of rot and mold and is a leading cause of building damage insurance claims. So by making the enclosure more airtight, we reduce moisture damage risk and we increase durability. And air tightness radically reduces heat loss. If we take two buildings, both well insulated equally, but one is leaky and the other airtight, the difference in heat loss could easily exceed a magnitude of five times five times the difference. They become totally different buildings based on air tightness alone. And so if in your energy calculations, design and construction, you can confidently provide greater air tightness, don't just hit passive house air tightness, go hit twice the air tightness. That first passive house in 1990 did just that. And you can eliminate lots of insulation if you do it. Another powerful aha moment 
is the realization that teams that are proficient in providing air tightness can achieve huge enclosure cost optimizations, construction savings, and greater design flexibility. In hot and humid conditions or climates, air tightness keeps the humidity out and reduces the demand for dehumidification, allowing the cooling system to be sized mostly for cooling, as it should be. Finally, where air leaks, noise also travels. If you are in a noisy environment, in the city or in the country, Passive House Air Tightness delivers peace and quiet. You can hear yourself think again. So for all these reasons, the truth is that a building can never be too airtight, and Passive House takes full advantage of this truth. Air tightness is a Passive House superpower that you can make your own superpower. Number four, high-performance windows and doors with solar protection. The flippin' thinking here, as we spoke in the beginning, is to rid ourselves of the unfortunate association people make with past passive solar buildings. And we must always be on guard to avoid overglazing and the accompanying overheating. The passive house solar buildings of the 1970s and onward were overglazed. They're typically out of balance and often uncomfortable. Let's be clear too that passive house buildings don't have tiny windows either. We're not building caves. Expansive views and abundant daylight are typical in passive house buildings. We will utilize passive solar heat gains as the windows can be designed to be a substantial part of our heating systems, but we are doing so while also being very conscious about the energy balance, about providing solar protection and the consequences. Restraint might be a good word for what we're showing off. A key concept here is that the windows and doors act not simply as a provider of views and daylight and a provider of passive heat gains, but they're a critical component in our continuous insulation and our continuous air tightness layers. The windows themselves are often triple pane and truly thermally broken and airtight with three layers of gasketing, typically. And the window connections to the surrounding construction, to the connections uh, with the surrounding airtight and insulation control layers must be airtight and insulated. Thermal bridge free connections, of course. This all gets you deep into the construction details, into the connections and the power of those details. Passive house windows can come in any type, metal, wood, metal clad wood, PVC, and fiberglass. There's dozens of suppliers to the U.S. market today, and there are several North American manufacturers producing Passive House certified units. Be sure to check out the certified component database on the PHI website, PassiveHouse.com. Window quality is a primary driver of comfort. And while there are a myriad of factors, the fundamental idea here is that our typical windows result in significant temperature asymmetry. In winter, the window is colder than the other room surfaces, and you feel that. It causes convective currents, and this needs to be overcome with perimeter mechanical systems. The common sad refrain of more power treating the symptoms. With Passive House, the windows are of a quality that the temperature is close enough to avoid discomfort and avoid the need for mechanical systems to compensate. Because windows are such a critical component and their performance cannot be compromised, we recommend the Passive House Institute certified windows are utilized. Like air tightness, high quality, high performance windows disproportionately affect the overall energy balance performance of the building. They offer greater design freedom. They offer flexibility and more options. They provide value that cannot be appreciated in an isolated budget line. And while windows provide our views and our daylight and yes, useful passive heat gains, improperly designed windows can cause significant overheating, resulting in discomfort and additional air conditioning requirements. And we know that overheating is a common problem in conventional buildings across the country today. The best approach to avoiding overheating is to carefully provide proper shading. Shading can be provided by how the window sits in the wall, an architectural element, or landscaping. Needed shading can be achieved with interior blinds, but exterior shading is the most effective. Shading cannot be an afterthought. Solar shading cannot be optional. Number five, 
high efficiency heat recovery ventilation. Let's recall back to the platonic definition of passive house. A primary goal was to ensure effective hygienic ventilation. Today, in coping with the COVID-19 pandemic, hygienic ventilation is a hot topic. Add to that the inescapable forest fire smoke and the long history of poor health outcomes for marginalized communities on the fence line of industrial production. Of course, hygienic ventilation should be a foundational goal. And remember also that what is going to set us up here for success is the airtight enclosure. There's no pollution entering willy-nilly as happens in typical construction. We have control of the interior air. Now, typical buildings have ventilation systems, just typically bad ones, often providing only intermittent exhaust from bathrooms and kitchens that don't ensure good ventilation everywhere. And in commercial buildings, the ventilation system often includes a lot of recirculated air. In a passive house building, we supply 100% fresh air to every served space, the bedrooms, the living rooms, offices, classrooms, and so on, and 100% exhaust from every service area, the bathrooms, the kitchens, the utility areas, and so on, operating continuously 24-7. The systems are all laid out as well to ensure that all spaces have robust ventilation. Again, there's zero recirculation. Now, such a system of 100% air changes would normally be prohibitively expensive to operate because typically you'll need to heat or cool that fresh air to maintain comfortable interior conditions. But this gives us the passive in ventilation because there is a passive heat exchange element located with the fan unit that allows the heat and energy from the outgoing airstream to move to the incoming airstream. And today, the efficiency of this passive exchange can exceed 90%. This means that on a cold winter day, the fresh air supply without any added heat enters the room within just a few degrees of the room temperature, ensuring occupant comfort. And Passive House Institute certified ventilation units ensure that you get the performance and cost savings you expect. In looking at the energy balance of the building and the building design, we are also going to look at things that provide internal passive heat gains as well. The people, appliances, and equipment, the lighting, the mechanical systems, because they can contribute significantly to providing the heat needed in the winter and unwanted heat in the summer. It all goes into the PHPP energy model. So, At this point, moving through the building design, the metaphorical fulcrum is pushed as far as it can go. The architectural design and other passive elements are doing the heavy lifting. Like the Gothic cathedral, the architecture is doing the work again. We've minimized the need for active heating and cooling and dehumidification. But depending on where you are, there will likely be a need for active heating, for active cooling, and maybe even active dehumidification. It's important to remember that this is about optimization, not magic tricks. So what we might typically see is the ability to meet occupant needs with about a 75% reduction in the mechanical equipment sizing and up to a 90% reduction in actual usage. Perimeter heating and cooling and radiant floors are not needed for comfort we can pull the distribution back to the core of the building, shrinking it and giving back space to the occupants. And because the loads are so low, electrifying the heating along with cooling is economical. We can get rid of hydronic heating if we like and provide heating and cooling from a single heat pump system. The only trick here is perhaps getting the mechanical engineer to agree with the plan because at first glance, they may see a building that will fail. I mean, how could it not with such a small mechanical system? It can take a few meetings, but with careful explanations, even engineers who we've seen initially energetically opposed can become ardent supporters. We need all you engineers out there on board. We can't do it without you. And then there are smart systems. Passive House is not opposed to incorporating smart systems and technology. Even the first Passive House had a CO2 detector to help control proper ventilation. 
but the smart systems should be about enhancing high performance. Smart systems should not be used to compensate for poor performance. Too often today, because architects have forfeited their power, massive and complex mechanical systems are employed that require expensive ongoing management. Some architects see these systems as enhancing their power to design, but it's not true. In fact, they've given up their design power. With Passive House, let's make the architecture do the work again. Then, and only then, let's incorporate the most efficient equipment and let's add smart systems as we like, but always with an eye toward greater simplicity. Let's simplify, simplify, and simplify. Our resilience really depends on it. So this methodology we've described has global applicability. It is being applied all over the world and the basic principles have local solutions. We are grappling with global crises and we can all work together around the world learning from each other to address them. So let's end here with another look around at a great variety of Passive House buildings underway. Some more examples. In China, Passive House is exploding. Here is an example of a guest hotel for a company south of Beijing. Today in China, entire new Passive House districts are being built. In the UK, in Exeter, they're building a municipal leisure center with big indoor swimming pools. Today in Exeter, the city builds everything to the Passive House standards, affordable housing, schools, administrative buildings, and now a leisure center. And the Congo is not a place you might necessarily expect to find a Passive House building, but Belgium certainly could be. They do a lot of Passive House in Belgium. So when the Belgian government planned their new embassy in Kinshasa, they made it a Passive House. Grimshaw Architects designed this stunning academic building at Monash University in Melbourne, Australia. And it's a certified Passive House. Sophisticated, affordable housing in Philadelphia that is net zero from on-site renewables. And here is a single-family scale building, although it's a retreat for musicians, truth be told, in southern Vermont. It's beautiful in setting and balance, and it shows that a modest building in a tough climate can be filled with light, have great views, and serious architectural expression. We can have it all. We just need to imagine it and work for it. So as the world heads towards climate tipping points and we plainly see the interconnections of these crises, let's have the imagination and determination to seize the inherent power of building and really leverage it so that we can confidently deliver better health outcomes, support greater equity, and deliver climate action proportionate to the emergency at hand. We see the push to zero carbon emissions on the horizon across the board and coming at us fast. Let's not wait another day, but instead, let's set ourselves up to meet that world by building Passive House buildings now. So are you thinking differently? Are you ready to act? Let's get to it. I hope to see you at future NAPHN Passive House trainings and events. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed this series. Be sure to watch more NAPHN Passive House content and sign up for the Certified Passive House Designer or Tradesperson courses. They are the most effective way to start building climate solutions now. There is no time to waste.